Good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Jose Andrade, and I'm a professor at the uh, California Institute of Technology. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. You can tell because engineers are wearing a tie. Uh, um, the uh, topic of my talk uh, today is uh, it's, it's sort of a broad overview of, of some of the things we've been doing uh, at Caltech, but also uh, some of the things we've been doing here at, at, with uh, our collaborators uh, in Grenoble. And before I, I begin this talk, I, I want to highlight that this is a collaborative research, as the previous excellent talk was highlighting. It's, it's an international collaboration. And in particular, I want to highlight our, our two collaborators from, from Grenoble. And you're going to see many uh, images coming out of the lab of uh, Professor Vigiani and also Ed Rolando. Uh, so that's, that's work done uh, here in collaboration with, with France. So let me begin uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes, give you an overview of, of, of what, what we're thinking of and what are some of the challenges uh, in, in this area. And, and this is going to be a, a, a technical talk, but it, it's meant to be for, for general public. So, my lab is uh, interested in studying uh, what I call granular patterns or granular materials. And you can think of these uh, from simple uh, materials like coffee or sands or soils. Uh, here's a picture of, 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 of sands that came from uh, here from Grenoble, uh, from the synchrotron. Uh, but you, can, you see it in other materials. We're studying a new collaboration here also in France, uh, studying um, sintering. Uh, but you, you see it also in uh, grains of metal. This is the, the granular structure at a much larger scale on the surface of Europa, the moon of Jupiter. Uh, these are some ice flows uh, floating uh, on the surface of the ocean. And uh, there are people even taking these concepts all the way to uh, studying cities. Uh, this is one of my favorite cities in the world. This is Barcelona. And, and you see that uh, there you have a very clear pattern uh, of, of grains. And, and what we study in, in, in our lab and, and with our collaborators is how these granular structures interact. And, and usually they're very simple at the grain scale, uh, and their interactions are simple, but then as you aggregate the behavior, it becomes very, very complex. So today I, I want to fly you over these three different uh, topics. We're going to uh, think about the why would you want to build something on Mars? and how would you do it. Then I'll get a little more detailed and, and, and not focus so much in civil engineering, but in engineering in, in general and what, what are the challenges there. And then I'll show you some of, some of the things we're planning to do, in particular with this uh, uh, current probe that is on the surface of Mars. Again, here's a great example of, a, of an international collaboration. This is InSight. Uh, which is currently on the surface of Mars, and this is a collaboration between the Americans, the Germans, and, and the French. Uh, and so I'll, I'll tell you uh, what we're doing there um, in, uh, towards the end. So let me quickly start with the, uh, the why. Um, so here I want to introduce an analogy, so maybe some of you are familiar with this concept of uh, koan, right, that uh, usually is a paradox that will help us uh, understand an, an inadequate way of uh, understanding or, or doing logical reasoning. Uh, and, and in that process, if you think hard enough about a koan, and here's an example, uh, the promise is that you may reach enlightenment. Um, so I, I want to, understand, I want to uh, introduce the concept of an engineering koan or an econ, where you, you think of something that is paradoxical, like for example, building on Mars, to demonstrate the inadequacy of traditional processes or the ways that we do things here on Earth. And in particular in engineering, here I'm thinking of things like correlations or empirical relationships that work really well on Earth because we have a lot of experience and a lot of data, but would completely break down under different environments. And hopefully if we think hard enough about those traditional approaches, we can then innovate in a way that it's very uh, transformative. That's the idea. Uh, but there are real reasons besides the econ to build on Mars and to do things uh, outside of our planet. This is the era, the golden era of planetary exploration. Uh, again, we, we're understanding things uh, ranging from black holes, but also JPL right now, the Jet, 
Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which Caltech uh, manages for NASA, has never had more probes in our solar system or outside of our solar system as we currently have. So we're really active in exploring our solar systems and beyond, our solar system and beyond. And the idea is to become more in contact, to do more in situ exploration and land in different places. There are also ideas of mining. So here's a rendering from a, a, a company trying to mine asteroids for resources that could range from energy to metals. Um, the idea of colonization, establishing some outposts somewhere, maybe on the moon, maybe on Mars. Uh, some people are now uh, arguing for other spots uh, in, the, in, in, in our solar system. But the idea of having human presence uh, out there. And, of, and, and the main thing I'm going to say today is that I think there are many things that we can do here on Earth as we think about doing things outside of our planet. And here's an example, and this is going to be uh, the main idea of, of the talk, and that is that uh, we have some real issues here. Um, and for instance, here's your graph that you've probably seen uh, a lot uh, already, right? These are the CO2 emissions on our planet from the beginning of a century to, until now. You see this huge ramp, right, from the 1900s all the way to now. And Perhaps you can see in the back that cement, actually, in the production of construction materials like cement and steel are one of the largest producers of uh, CO2. And uh, here are some um, predictions that by 2050, for instance, the world population will increase to about 20 bi uh, 10 billion. Um, about three-fourths of that population will be living in urban environments. Uh, this used to be the opposite one-fourth of the population used to live in, in cities. And this is one that really shocks me. Uh, by 2050, we will need to increase our infrastructure by 100%. Someone put it this way to me the other day. By 2050, we will have to rebuild all of civilization all over again. And when you think about that, that's a huge technological challenge in terms of materials, in, in terms of technology, in terms of CO2 emissions. And at the same time, we want to reduce CO2 to about 50% of the values of 1990 or uh, 1980. So um, major challenges uh, along these lines, building eight New York cities per year. Uh, and the challenge in engineering, for instance, is that the main materials are cement and steel. Um, and so the strategies to make all of this happen, we claim, are that you, know, you have to use alternative materials, less by design, uh, and reduce energy intensity, and of course, reduce CO2 production. So this is a, a huge opportunity for civil engineering, but for engineering in general, and, and I would claim for, for science. And when you think about that, that is very aligned with what you have to do if you want to build things on Mars. So here are two concepts, one from Mars and the other one from the moon. This is coming from SpaceX. What would it take to have a, a, um, an outpost uh, on the moon to launch rockets, uh, for instance? And so you have to build uh, things like uh, habitats or, or posts. And uh, what would you, you need to build an infrastructure, right, so that this, this happens. And you don't have cement and steel. Uh, on, on Mars or on the moon, and you can't bring it. Uh, so you're going to have to use less material and alternative materials by design. And all of this construction will have to take place robotically. You don't want to send humans uh, to do that. And so here's an opportunity to really reinvent uh, engineering and think about the ways in which we, we use materials and we use people uh, to accomplish uh, our tasks. Um, and uh, so. The question is how to do it on Mars. Um, and so radical innovation, and in, in this can serve as, a, as, a, as an econ, as I said before. Mm. So let me show you some ideas on, on the kind of work we're doing and, and the interaction we, we have with, with Grenoble in particular. So one of the things we're curious about is characterizing regolith or uh, soils that are um, extraterrestrial soils. And, and we know a lot about soils here on, on Earth, but when we go to places like Mars, so this is uh, Spirit. Remember Spirit and Opportunity, they just stopped uh, working recently. But when I came to Caltech, Spirit was stuck. 
and he was stuck in Martian sands, and this is a picture of that wheel of uh, spirit interacting with the Martian sands, and two people from uh, JPL came to my office and they said, you know, we understand that you like uh, granular materials and you study them, can you help us uh, understand how to get spirit unstuck? Of course, we, we couldn't help them. <laughs> spirit was uh, pretty stuck, but that led us to believe that we knew very little about the properties of these materials on the surface of Mars. And that launched a research project uh, that focused on the interaction between uh, spacecraft. Here you see the, the model of a wheel interacting with, uh, with soil or regolith underneath it and how these interactions happen and what were the fundamental mechanics uh, going on underneath. And some people have studied this topic, but there's literally very few uh, uh, research papers in trying to understand the mechanics of this surface material. So this is uh, coming from Caltech. This is Ron Scott, my predecessor, trying to understand these materials uh, on the moon and trying to compare them uh, trying to compare the mechanical behavior from the moon material to the Earth. These are uh, scratch experiments on the m surface of Mars. Uh, this is, I think, coming from uh, Phoenix or one of those, and I think this comes from, uh, from one of the rovers. Uh, one is a wheel experiment, the other one is scratching with a scoop. There's been some uh, experiments taking place at the space station uh, under zero gravity, but for instance, basic things like just trying to understand the strength of these materials under microgravity has been extremely limited. Uh, so there's a whole debate as to whether gravity influences the strength of these materials or not. So we did work uh, to try and understand the behavior of these materials under microgravity by taking uh, these materials on a, what's called a vomit comet, right? You fly, uh, <laughs> And you, you get why it's called a vomit comet, because you, you do these parabolas hundreds of times to simulate low gravity for a window of about 20 to 30 seconds. And then you run experiments that need to be autonomous, because you're so sick and so uh, perturbed by the low gravity that you can't really interact much with this uh, apparatus. So I won't tell you, I won't bore you with the details. I'll just tell you that there is a theory behind it that allows you to from observations from uh, like this one, so here's the experiment, pushing on this material, you can then understand how the material deforms. And then from those observations, you're able to tell about the mechanical properties of a material under different gravity environments, say Mars, Moon, and even zero G. Um, and here's a video of what that environment looks like. So here's uh, part of a crew, we're floating along you see that there's a person trying to interact with the experiment, but he's essentially just observing what's going on. Uh, it's extremely hard to interact. And, and here's the material. It looks like it's upside down or underwater, but this is uh, what happens is it flips under zero gravity, and you're, uh, again, pushing the material to understand the, me the mechanics of it. And from that, you can get uh, really cool results, okay, like uh, what are these gravity or these uh, strength properties under uh, microgravity, and in, in this particular study, we came to the conclusion that gravity plays very little role, uh, and, and okay, we published those results and, uh, and uh, you know, participated in the debate in the literature of whether this has an influence or not, uh, gravity has an influence or not in, in strength. But I want to then now switch to the next topic that will connect with Grenoble, which is in the process of doing these experiments and in trying to understand these materials, we've been trying to build models, uh, physics-based models, that tell us how these materials behave. So here is a computational model, a computer model of the experiment. And I won't go into the details, but I think you can see from this chart, DEM here is the model, uh, the blue data is the experiment. These computational models are able to predict the behavior or reproduce the experiment computationally. Uh, and they can follow and predict the mechanical behavior extremely well. And they're extremely valuable because experiments allows, allow us to understand things, but models allow us to predict. And when you're trying to predict behavior, it's really models that allow you to do that. that here's another example of a model. And these are physics-based physics models, and, and the way we've been able to, uh, to build these models has a root, actually, with Grenoble and the synchrotron. These are experiments done here in Cino Vigiani's lab that uh, 
begun at the synchrotron, now they have their own X-ray transmitter in the lab, in the 3SR lab here uh, on campus. But what they were doing 10 years ago was revolutionary because they were able to put these materials under loading, so here's your sample, while at the same time they were shooting X-rays. And the, the reason why this is revolutionary was that in the last 100 years people were doing this kind of experiments, but they could only get surface or boundary measurements. Uh, here in Grenoble, uh, they were able to use X-rays to take pictures like this one. Here's an X an X-ray slice of this sample, and when they stitch them together, they're able to see the microstructure in situ while they're doing the test. And this is revolutionary because this means that you not only get the boundary measurements as you typically do in material science, but you also see how the microstructure is changing as you are perturbing the material. So this was an advancement in experiments here at uh, Grenoble, and this inspired us to then think about what would it take to build computational models, computer models that took the data that you were getting here in France and build models that could replicate the same kind of experiments. So here you don't see an X-ray picture anymore. This is a computational model. It's an avatar of the experiment here in France. It's also 3D, and it has the same boundary conditions as in the experiments. And qualitatively, it looks realistic, but what's most important for material science is that the behavior, for instance, here's the stress strain, the main mechanical behavior of the sample from the experiment and the computation are exactly the same. And, and this is a physics-based model. There are no parameters to tune. Everything is coming from the physics, and the behavior is being replicated, uh, not only at the boundaries, but also at the grain scale level. These are failure pictures from the sample and the experiment. This is coming from the computation. So these physics-based models have an incredible power in replicating and then predicting the, the mechanical behavior of this material. So this is one of my favorite renderings. Here is a, a, a picture of that same experiment. Here you see some grains of sand interacting with each other, collapsing, and you see these so-called force chains that evolve. And over here, you see the kinematics related to those forces. And this is something that you cannot render experimentally yet, uh, because you cannot measure forces yet in these materials, uh, because they're, they're opaque, they're not photoelastic. Uh, but you can do it computationally. And this is a rendering coming from the computation. This you can get from the experiments. So, Computations and experiments are playing together to give us a, a basic understanding of the material that was just not, not there before. Uh, let me switch uh, gears and show you uh, some, some work on, on structures and what, what it would take to build things on, on places like Mars. So this was a NASA challenge um, uh, to 3D print houses on Mars or habitats. Uh, and uh, right now, we just finished the uh, phase three where we were 3D printing scaled habitats to about one-fourth of a real scale. The next phase will be coming up soon and it will be a full-scale habitat. But think about that challenge for a second for 3D printing and for materials and for engineering in, in general. Here's the rendering from the architect. All you have on Mars, mostly speaking, or roughly speaking, is regolith or soil. So. You need to think about building structures like this one, just with soils. That's all you have available to you. And you want to do it probably using 3D printing or some block uh, strategy. So here was a, a particular strategy that was designed at Caltech. The first part of a, of a challenge was to 3D print a foundation. And you want to do it autonomously, and you want to do it with, with regolith. So you're, you're having to design a gantry system and a robotic uh, concept without using the typical materials, but very rough materials like, like regolith. And then once you print things, like the foundation or blocks, then you want to have a robot probably place them together like in a Lego fashion and, and come up with structures like that. And here there's a concept uh, that is interlocking blocks uh, that can then uh, create structures. And you want to do this with less material, fast, and with most importantly with Mars materials. And so here are some of those physical renderings. These are you know, the first blocks that we 3D printed. 
And here we're using this concept of less material by design, right? Because there are parts of the, of the blocks that are under very little load, and you don't need to use material there. And here's a computer model now analyzing the forces and how you would build these three-dimensional uh, structures to create uh, spaces like, like this one, very complex structures. And of course, here are the students in the, in the lab, in the garage, uh, trying to 3D print these materials and again, come up with technologies that are suitable for 3D printing on very rough terrains like this one uh, to simulate the surfaces of, of, of extraterrestrial planets. Let me, let me um, just finish then with, with, with the last part, which connects with technology and, and artificial intelligence. Um, and here's the motivation for that. Uh, so what would it take to uh, shape the Earth or another planet autonomously? And this is a, a challenge that is very relevant here on Earth. Here's a mine, an open pit mine. And you send humans right now down here, and they really don't want to be there. Um, and so can you just do this autonom autonomously? It has huge implications in terms of finance uh, money uh, here on Earth. Caterpillar is extremely interested in this kind of technologies because you can save up to 50% of the operational cost if these machines, for instance, like this loader that you see here, can become autonomous. The challenge, though, is understanding the loads in the interaction between the loader, let's say, and these granular materials. And that's where automation is right now stuck. And doing this interaction with computation is not possible because you would have to do it on board and in real time. So this is prohibitive in terms of computational cost. But maybe AI or artificial intelligence has a way of helping here. And so what I'm going to show you at the end of this talk is how we're connecting AI with the physical environment to do predictions of physics in a way that bypasses the physics. So I won't bore you with the details. This is a very classic equation in mechanics, in granular physics. This says that the stress in a granular array of particles, in an array of particles like this one, so the stress felt by this array, is directly related to the forces that the particles are feeling uh, times the distance between the particles. In, in, it's the centroids between the particles, OK? This is a physics-based equation. And this has been derived and re-derived, and, and we know this is true. The question for AI is, can we not inform it of this equation, but have AI predict the level of stress in, a, in, a, in an array of particles? And to do that, we took inspiration, of course, from uh, image recognition algorithms. And uh, I won't have time to tell you how those work in, in, in general, but this is the analogy, which is you have pixels that tell you RGB values at a at a, at a, at a, in a picture, let's say, and as you stitch those RGB values together in space, there is a certain spatial correlation. You can use that analogy for granular materials and give the RGB values as the force measurements, let's say, of the particle forces, and then try to predict this uh, stress using AI. That's the idea. And for that, we, we do an experiment where we do have access to the forces in the particles, but also the stresses in the array. So we have everything. This is reality. And you get curves like this from this kind of experiments. And then you ask AI if it can reproduce uh, this, this plot. So here's a, for, a, a stress over time for that experiment that we did. Uh, there is a, an actual experimental curve, the blue curve. And then you ask AI to reproduce that curve. And of course, you have to train it. And here, we're using about 30% of the data to train it and 70% to, to predict. So all we're doing here is interpolation, if you will. Um, and then we do crazy things, like we give it incomplete information, we contaminate the data, and we still are able to uh, predict the behavior really well. But so far, all we're doing is interpolating. This one is remarkable. This one is a true ex extrapolation in time. So this is a true prediction in time. You train the algorithm, the AI algorithm, with the blue curve to half of a time, and then you ask it to predict. So that's the blue dots here. 
and you see that the blue dot, uh, the, the, the green dots rather, uh, follow really well the, the red curve. Okay, so AI is predicting the future now based on information in the past. And this is remarkable because AI works really well in soft data in, you know, whether you want to watch another movie given that you've watched this previous movie in the past, but this is a, a, a prediction with physical data, with forces, with the physical environment, which is extremely difficult to do. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this part. This is more AI stuff, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to leave you with the thought that AI is able to also recognize patterns in the forces. So these materials carry forces, as I showed you before. This is real measurement of forces in the laboratory, and these are generated forces using AI. Again, no physics here. It's just artificial intelligence. You can see that the patterns are the same, and more importantly, the forces are pretty much the same, uh, and no physics. Let me close by taking you back to Mars. Uh, so here is insight on the surface of Mars, and these are my last slides. Um, this is a wonderful instrument that, we, that carries a, seismo a seismometer that was developed here in France by Kness. This is a, a heat probe that will go down about five meters into the ground to measure temperature. So between these two, we'll take the, the, the vital signs of Mars to understand its, its, its core composition. I'm on the, on the science team for this mission. And I'm just going to tell you, this is a selfie from the uh, spacecraft as it landed on the surface of Mars. And these are the two instruments on the surface of Mars. Here's the seismometer, and here's the heat probe. And this is my last slide. This wonderful experiment is doing terrific things on the surface of, of Mars. Here is something that we're very interested in. This will be the deepest characterization outside of our planet. The only other place outside of Earth where we have this kind of information is the moon. And here's what it's going to be about. So, so the, the seismometer is sitting here as the heat probe is trying to hammer itself down, like I said, to a depth of about five kilometers, uh, five meters, uh, not five kilometers, not yet. Uh, and, um, and it's emitting waves, right, as it's hammering down. So the seismometer is listening to those waves. And those waves have velocities that are a function of the elasticity of this material. Uh, at the same time, there's an arm that you can do to do indentation, poking on the surface. Again, the force and the deformation is a function of the elasticity of the material. So with this information, you can figure out the elasticity of these materials to about five meters uh, depth. Uh, from the heat probe, you can come up with other types of characterization, like the, like the uh, ability for the material to carry heat, like thermal conductivity. And then we're going to do scratching on the surface, or scraping, to understand the strength of a, of a terrain. And then we're going to build piles to understand erosion uh, and also some uh, strength properties of the material. So this is extremely exciting because this is the foundation, the core for understanding the mechanical and thermal properties of these materials and then be able to do uh, much greater things uh, in the future. With that, I think I'm almost exactly half an hour uh, within the, the, the allotted time and I'll be very happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for, for this uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, have uh, time for uh, one or two questions, and we, you, co you can go on uh, uh, the speaking with uh, uh, our, our colleague, the professor Andrade, at the, at the coffee break. Yes? Okay. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, could some of the techniques that you used to build um, structures on Mars uh, using only the composition of the, uh, the Martian soil be used to solve the engineering, engineering issues in, on Earth? Right, that's a great question and that's exactly the point. I, I didn't say that, but yeah, one of, the, one of the goals of this research is to do affordable housing 
So the concept is that if you can build things on Mars, you can probably build them anywhere here on Earth with the in situ materials without having to use much cement and in this way build structures that are, for instance, easily deployable and very cheap. So you can think of providing homes for the homeless. There are, there are projections of about one billion people not having uh, affordable housing in, on the planet. So that's a huge challenge. And we think that this technology could help with that. So. Is it currently affordable or is it really, really expensive? No, right now it's not, of course. And it, it, it doesn't scale well. Um, otherwise, I, I would be doing construction already. <laughs> so, um, but we think it will be, uh, there, there are no, there are, let me put it this way, there are no fundamental barriers that would uh, not allow it to scale in the future. Thank you. We have seen nice pieces of innovation for research, but because this week is a bit more than a research uh, symposium, I think we have to take some caution when we are speaking of technology which are ideas and not real things, and particularly concerning Mars. Yes. You know, uh, there is great hope about Mars, and I, I am a Martian, I'm working on Curiosity and Mars 2020, but uh, uh, concerning the ability, the habitability of the surface of Mars, mm. Curiosity has demonstrated it is not habitable, the surface of Mars is not habitable nowadays right. because of this 0.66 uh, sievert of radiation. Right. We have to think something totally new. Right. And we know it's more than that. Crossing the space between Earth and even Moon is nowadays challenging. It was not 50 years ago be because we, do not, we did not know the problem of uh, sun radiations. Now we know. Right. Uh, that's the first problem with, uh, concerning Mars. And the second problem is mining. As an exogeologist, I'm still looking for an asteroid which is valuable for mining with the constraints that are on Earth for mining. We know there are resources, but one, kilo, one, square, uh, one cubic kilometer of water, of uh, oceanic water, contains gold, much gold but it's dispersed, and it, right. apparently it's still the same for asteroid. Planetary mining is, for me, science fiction, not more. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I agree with the first statement. I think that uh, definitely there are many issues regarding the habitability of Mars, and uh, I think that that's why I started by saying that this is an engineering con at this, uh, at this moment, right? This is not saying that we're going to build on Mars uh, the day after tomorrow. This is more thinking about, well, what would it take to do that? And then while you're solving that, you can address things like uh, affordable housing on, 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 on Earth. Um, regarding mining, it is true that currently there, there are many challenges, challenges uh, regarding the, uh, the availability of resources, but also uh, our knowledge of the composition and the and the geology of these planets, as you know, is very superficial. So as we improve our knowledge, as we prospect uh, better, as we do here on Earth, I think we're going to discover uh, resources that could be scalable. And uh, you know whether this happens or not, again, it's up to debate. Uh, but I think uh, as, you know, as an engineer and as a scientist, it's good to pose those questions of what would it take so that you can then challenge the current state of the technology here on Earth. And then, you know, as uh, Yogi Berra said, it's difficult to predict, especially the future. So. Okay, thank you. We will, uh, the, the last question. Yes? Okay. Two, two? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm a um, data scientist in energy. And I was really interested about the using artificial intelligence for materials behavior. Yes. And I was wondering um, did, if you did compare what physicals, the physical results and the machine learning results, 
And if you maybe do you combine the models or do you use one or the other? Right. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a wonderful question. I, I didn't, um, of course, address that because uh, uh, we didn't have time. But for instance, here's a, here's a comparison between the synthetic forces, the ones that come from AI, and the real ones. And you see this exponential decrease in the forces. That's a signature of these materials. AI is able to pick that up. And also the magnitude of the forces is not too far off. So this tells us that uh, AI is very good at picking up these patterns. Now, the future is probably a combination between AI and physics-based. Because the problem with AI, as you know, is that it's, it's not good for extrapolating. Uh, so what we're dreaming of is an AI that can be taught on the fly new behaviors by the physics-based models. So we probe a little bit of the material response. We pass that knowledge to AI, and then we use AI to do fast computations, fast predictions. So we, we're, we're dreaming of this uh, AI that is instructed by physics-based models on the fly, and, and, and that's the concept right now, and we're playing with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We have time for the last question, if you want. It's time for coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you, much. Professor Andrade.